Hi everyone, Steve Richard here. Welcome to Call Camp, how to lose a call in 10 seconds. <clears throat> when, uh, when Sam and Morgan came up with this topic, I said, you know, at first I went, oh, you know, because we got to basically play a lot of bad calls. And that's probably why our attendance is so good. We have more than 900 people, 900 of you have registered for this thing. So thank you for being a part of it. But then my next reaction was, you know what? People learn from mistakes. And if we can't learn from our mistakes, we're not going to get any better. All right. So we're going to talk, we'll talk about that in a moment. But first, I have a little bit of sad news I have to share with everyone. Um, some of you may have known a guy named Don Cash. He was a sales leader at Omniture and BMC software. He was a great customer of Exec Vision uh, and a really good friend of mine. And he was on a quest to, to climb the seven summits of the world. This is in fact him if, uh, flying the Exec Vision flag that we got for him on the, on the uh, summit of Mount Vincent in Antarctica. So he's literally standing in Antarctica here. And the sad news is that he, he, he uh, made it to the, to the peak of Everest and he, um, he passed away on the way down. So uh, very much in, in my personal heart, and I think a lot of our hearts, Mr. Don Cash, love you, man. And uh, he, he hit his seven summits, he made it. All right, so the guys for today, now let's get back to the topic at hand, are Morgan Ingram, Chad Dyer. Morgan, say hello, please. Hey, what's going on, everybody? And Chad. How's it going? We have some pretty impressive firepower here today. So I'm gonna be shorter on words because the two of these guys uh, know what they're talking about. Get ready. Uh, Twitter is going to be a blaze here. Tweet us at Call Camp. Um, you know, please raise hands with questions. Uh, ask your questions in the GoToWebinar panel, and let's get the conversation started because this is one that is really, really galvanizing. The the community of of uh, sales professionals that have to deal with these types of unscheduled calls. I don't care if it's as a result of someone filling out a web form. I don't care if it's even a requested demo or if it's a pure cold outbound call, good old fashioned in the yellow pages or whatever. The reality is the beginning of that call, if it's an unscheduled, unexpected call, will make or break your call. And, it, and it's, it's hard to get it right and it's hard to get that rhythm down. And oh, by the way, when you get it down, it doesn't work equally for all personas. Uh, Chad Burmeister and I actually talked about this exact topic on a previous webinar where he said, hey, if you're calling HR professionals saying, um, did I catch you for, uh, did I, can I catch you for 27 seconds doesn't work at all. But if you're calling sales leaders, it works great because they've tested it. So with that, I'm going to hand the reins off to the very capable Morgan Ingram. Morgan, take it away. Hey, what's going on, everybody? And uh, we'll be leading you all in a couple content here before we dive into the calls. And essentially, I also have Chad here as well who will add some commentary. So big thing we're talking about today is the rise of the new sales rep so just as steve was talking about different intros that you have to be thinking about when it's calling each persona there's not a telltale motion for each one it's not a generic thing that you're going to do as we move more into this role especially when it comes into prospecting and lead generation and making cold calls as a sales rep we have to pay attention to what intros we do and i and i always use this as an example because i got shell shocked by this when i first was when i started started as a rep and i always give people context on this so People, most people that are reps use the intro, how are you doing today? So when I first started at my job, I always use that intro. I'm from the South, so I call people in the South, and that was a very simple intro. Always got a good conversation because people are very nice down here, right? But made a mistake. So I use that same type of intro with someone in New York. So I called them and I said, you know, hi, this is Morgan from X company. I said, how are you doing today? And they go, what? And I was like, uh, and I hung up the phone. And I was not prepared for that conversation. So what we're going to talk about today is like, I just lost, obviously lost that call in the first 10 seconds, how we're not going to lose that call. And the techniques, the tips, the coaching that we're about to talk you all through is how we're going to dive into that. So really pay attention here on how, from a standpoint of how we're talking about the rise of new sales rep, how AI is coming into play. I know you just mentioned Chad, he's got an AI tool, but I, how AI is coming into play, how different tools have to come into play and how we have to have a structure for our process and also adding new intros and skill sets along the way. And this also goes into A-B testing, making sure that we're doing the right things across the board so that we can do that. So I don't know, Chad, if you wanna add anything to that. And so we're gonna dive into content versus context here. So I don't know if you guys are familiar with Gary Vanderchuk, uh, but I was watching one of his talks and he said, hey, if content is king, then context is God. And so people were asking on this webinar, what in the world does that mean, Morgan? So essentially what that means is content. So the content, like I just told you guys, the story of, hey, how are you doing today? That is more so content. A lot of reps are used to that motion. And Steve and I were talking about for this call, 
is most reps, they're in a pit. And so if they hear that intro from another rep, they're essentially going to use that same intro. Even if they were trained differently, innate nature, human nature, you're going to listen to people around you, you're going to use that same intro. So over time, you're just used to using that intro. And, it's, and then, again, if that intro might not be the best because you got to base it on persona. So what we're going to talk about a lot today is industries you're reaching out to, personas you're reaching out to, business segments you're reaching out to as a sales rep to make sure you have the right context when you're doing this intro. Because if you don't have that right intro, if you're not being impactful in the first and seconds, you'll lose the call. Most data says if you don't have a powerful intro, if you don't have an insight, if you're not reaching out with the reason for your call, then you're going to lose that call in less than seconds. And then now what I like to call is the uphill battle with the prospect because they don't know what you're talking about. They're now confused. And now you're playing a game you don't want to play. So a lot of stuff we're going to talk about is how can you be contextual with your intro from the cold call standpoint and making sure every single time you do make that call, you're calling with confidence. Yeah, I think about when I started 15 years ago and was on the phone and just had a big long list on paper of people I was calling, there wasn't research, there wasn't a lot of tools to be able to dig deep into. So now the differentiator is you have to put yourself in pre-call planning mode, learn some stuff about the people that you're going to call so that you can develop that context before you start that conversation. And, and I actually want to dive into that piece, Chad. What, what, were you, what did you do to make sure, because I know people probably have this question, what did you do to make sure you had context before you made that call? Because obviously you can't you know, research every single account for an hour, but you at least had some telltale signs of what you were going to do. Honestly, back in the day before we had like even a CRM or Salesforce to lean on, it was really figuring out what worked and then repeating that and being able to basically build your own data set of this is the thing that's worked the most often, so I'm going to keep trying it, listen to what people around me are doing, find out what's working for them, and then di differentiate in that way. But it was a lot of experimentation 15, 20 years ago. Now sales reps click one button and you can see everything that's ever happened to the person that you're going to speak with. So there's just an abundance of information available. So you have to be able to pick through that and find the thing that's going to resonate with them to make them want to talk to you in the first 10 seconds of that call. Absolutely. And that, and that leads actually right into my next point, which is art versus science. So essentially, our, our science. So that's the framework. So as Chad was saying, you have to be a scientist, A-B testing. So the intro I just said earlier, I eventually changed my intro. My intro now to gain that momentum in the call is, let's say if I'm calling Chad, I'd be like, hey, Chad, thanks for taking my call. Do you have a few moments? Now, as you all just noticed, I didn't mention my name. I didn't mention my company. The reason I do that is to provide curiosity because as humans from a psychology standpoint, we're always curious on two things when a cold call happens, which is one, who is this person? Two, what do they want? So by not stating those two things, most innate answer for a human is going to be, who are you? Then they're going to say, then I can go into my value prop of, hey, this is Morgan Ingram. I'm from JBL Sales Training. The reason for my call is, and now they're going to give, they've given me the right to talk and now I don't get cut off and now I have a good conversation. And in that intro, a lot of people would be like, well, what if they say no? Well, if they say they don't have a couple minutes, then I could be like, when's the best time to call back? And I could call them back with a different intro because I never announced myself. So that's something for an ad, but Chad, do you want to add something there? No, I think it's brilliant. It's a great way to go about it. I mean, you want to get them talking as soon as possible because I think one of the biggest mistakes is that first 10 minutes is all you, or first 10 minutes, pardon me, the first 10 seconds is all you and not getting them engaged in the call, and that's where you lose them. If the first thing they say is no thanks, you've already lost the call. Hey, Chad, Morgan, hold on. Got a great question. Go ahead. Yeah, so our first question comes from Lauren, and she's wondering, do you feel by asking permission to go forward on the call, are you opening the door for an instant now? And I know this is a hotly debated topic, so I want to hear everybody's take. Yes. Well, the thing is, as I was saying earlier, if they say, no, I don't have a couple moments, that's completely fine with me. Because then I'm going to say, okay, when's the best time to call you back? And then they're going to give me a time. But the, my whole, the whole purpose there, though, is that I can always call back and they don't know who I am. Essentially, let's say that, okay, Morgan, I don't like that approach. You can do another approach. So if they say no, then essentially they answer the phone. So I know they at least have 30 to 60 seconds. Otherwise, they wouldn't have answered the phone. So essentially I'll say there, hey, look, I know that, you know, you may be super busy right now, but can I at least have 30 seconds to explain my value prop? And if you find that there is some interest here, we can put time on the calendar. However, if you find no interest here, you can hang up. So now I give them another out to at least give me 30 seconds because they know I'm going to call them back to at least give them 30 seconds to iterate my value prop. And then in that 30 seconds, I should have a 30 second pitch. And if they find value in that, then I'll in return get that meeting. If they don't, at least I got my value prop off and I know they're not interested and I just need to call someone else as a contact information. So those are two ways that I handle it. But essentially, if they say no, I at least have a plan for it because, yeah, some people will just say no. But 
they at least don't know who I am. So if they just give me a time to call back again, I can just call that same number, different number that I'm calling them with, with a different intro approach. And, and Lauren, I, this is Steve, just something, sorry, Chad, something real quick that's interesting that we, we ran a test where we did measure, we had a, a bunch of different interns back in, uh, this was about seven years ago, that were calling in and either using permission to continue or not using permission to continue. And what we found, two interesting findings that were fascinating. Number one, the percentage of time that people said yes for permission to continue and the percentage of time that when there was no permission to continue, the person still said, I gotta run was the same. So it really didn't matter if you asked or not, your ultimate result was the same because it was based on the behavior of the buyer. In this case, they had to go to another meeting or go to their kid's soccer game. The second thing that was interesting is we tested different approaches. Like, do you have a quick sec? Or um, I know I'm catching out of the blue. Um, the reason for the call is we tried a, different, a bunch of different approaches. And depending on the rep that did it, we got different results very different results, in fact. So what we concluded from all of this, and there was a lot of you know calling and doing this and basically saying wrong number after that hanging up, it was crazy. What we concluded from all of this is the confidence with which the individual does that method is what makes all the difference in the world. So because Morgan does that method so effectively, by the way, that's a clever method. I've never heard that before. To kind of like reverse it and put, put, put it so you're in the driver's seat. They're asking you, who is this? What is this about? Boom, you got the end. If you do it right with confidence, you're fine. If you don't, you're gonna have to go and try a different method until one works for you. Sorry, Chad, go ahead. No, you totally copied my homework. I was gonna go right to confidence. That's <laughs> the, the leading uh, indicator of how it's gonna go because if you seem really scared to ask that question, you're gonna get steamrolled. But if you come on strong, it, it, I mean, you can open a lot of different things if you're confident about it and keep people on the phone. Amen to that. Personas. Yeah, personas. And so right here, this comes down into what Steve was talking about, what Chad was just talking about, which is you have to have the art and the science and the framework to talk to these personas. So I know everyone on this call has different personas they're calling, so use your contextual eyes here to figure out what those are. But essentially, if above the power line, you're gonna have to come in with a reason for sure. Bottom the power line, okay, you obviously have to come with a reason, but if you're above the power line, you need to come with confidence. And I'm glad that you both mentioned that because that was exactly what I was gonna say here, is tonality and confidence. And I always, when I'm doing a sales training, I always ask the executive in the room when we're talking about cold calling, hey, if someone calls you with confidence and even if they're talking fast or maybe if it's not something that you directly need in this quarter, are you more likely to hear them out and take a meeting with them? And that answer majority of the time is yes. Mm -hmm. So the more confident that you are, the more confident that the person's gonna show up to the meeting. And think about it this way, is if I call Steve and it's what Steve wants, but maybe I sound hesitant or I sound awkward. Steve isn't gonna be excited or confident that what I'm telling him that we can help him with, I can actually help him with. Cause I don't even sound confident in my own thing. So why should Steve sound confident, be confident if he's never even met me? Same thing that I always tell people from a standpoint to add on top of that is my mentor always tells, tells me is sales is the transfer of enthusiasm. So when you're talking to these personas, especially above the power line, make sure that you're enthusiastic about what you're saying so they can understand and, and understand that message that you're conveying to them. And really the, 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 the thing is when someone answers the phone and they're not expecting to hear from you, the part of their brain that's activated, if you put them in an MRI, is called the amygdala. It's the brain stem. You hear Tim Reister or Corporate Visions talk about this. Um, that's the lizard brain or the old brain. Um, and that's the one that keeps you alive. So basically what's happening is unconsciously to the prospect, they're trying to decide is something that you're about to tell me or you just told me something that's gonna keep me alive or not. And if it's not, I'm out. I do not care. If it's something that might have impact or implication on my existence, all of a sudden a different part of the brain, the, the prefrontal cortex or the rational part of the brain engages. So that's the key to the whole thing is how do we get past the lizard brain and get them into the cortex? Hey, Morgan, well, can for our audience, uh, can you explain what the power line is? Yes. So essentially what the power line is, is let's say, again, this is context of how I see it. I know it's different for everybody because some people may not be calling directors or VPs. So essentially above the power line would be a VP or a C-suite. Uh, those are the people who are making the decisions. Uh, those are the decision makers. Uh, those are the people who are signing off on the checks or the contracts. Uh, below the power line are the people that can be influencers or champions, but they aren't the people who are actually signing off on the deal. Now, you can call someone who's the 
influencer champion, also bottom of the power line, is an end user for some of you guys, maybe who have like a product or solution. Above the power line are people who are signing off and eventually you have to get the power. So if you're, doesn't matter really, just if you're a sales rep in general and you have to eventually close a deal, you've got to talk to someone above the power line. So a lot of stuff we're gonna talk about today is winning that call in the first couple seconds so you can get there instead of spinning your wheels with what I like to call fireside chats with people below the power line. <laughs> How do we cold call in a modern sales world? The biggest thing here is having a systematic approach. So one thing that I read in a, a sales book that really hit home with me was if you have an organized schedule, you get organized results. So essentially that means you gotta figure out what times you're making cold calls. What most people do when they make cold calls, and I'm, I'm guilty of this because I did it as a rep, is you make, a, you make 10, 15 cold calls. You get a meeting, you're fired up, you high five everyone in the office, you show your manager how great the call was, you start talking to everyone else in the department, you start talking about Game of Thrones, you start talking about the NBA Finals, and then you realize you only made 10 to 15 calls and you're leaving at five o'clock saying like, wait, what? why only made 10 to 15 calls? Why am I hitting my number? It's because you're not organized. It's the same thing happened to me. So how do you cold call in a modern sales world? We know that you have to make a higher volume of calls. It's not like 10, 15 years ago where everyone's picking up the phone. So what you have to do is make sure you have a segmented process. So in the morning and the afternoon, what are your time blocks? I like to say have it in a 30 or an hour. So 30 minutes, 60 minute incremental time blocks to make those calls. And that's how you cold call in the new sales world. I say morning, lunch, afternoon, pick your time slots and make those calls. All right, conquering the call in the beginning. How are we doing it? So big thing is the intro. So there's a couple things you can do. You can say my intro that I just introduced to y'all, the second one. So remember I said two things that people focus in on the call is who is this person and what do they want? So if I can address those two things and Steve talked about the brain component of it, right? Is I can say, hey, Chad, you don't know me. I don't know you. The reason for my call is I've immediately knocked off the two reasons of why you'd be hesitant to even listen to me. So I'm going to dive straight into it. Now, obviously, with that approach, some people can be like, wait, hold up, like, who are you, right? But I'm diving straight into it, and now I'm pattern interrupting. Uh, three is you can lead straight with the insight. Hey, Chad, this is Morgan Ingram from j -Bro Sales Training. The reason for my call is I was looking at your website and then explain exactly what it is. Be very granular, be very specific, show that you've done your research, because if someone calls me and they show that they've done research in the first five or 10 seconds, I'm going to hear them out because most calls aren't like that. So conquering the call in the beginning comes to pattern interrupts the more pattern interrupts that you have of a call is the most important so when you think about starting the call always think about what are other reps doing do it a little bit differently so then the person on the other side of the phone is they're interrupted with the pattern of getting the same call every single day it's different allows you to have a better approach hey morgan i think there's a personality component as well chad go ahead i think chad, go ahead there's a yeah. personality component as well which i think you, you want to be delighted to speak to someone because how many calls are you making during the day and actually connecting to someone and it almost shifts you out of a weird gear because you're robotically dialing through and then you get a voice and it's like wow what just happened and uh, and then you kind of shift into this other robotic motion of, of the value proposition that you've done a thousand times so i think there's there's an element of delight that you can bring to the beginning of a call that's going to make me as someone who gets a ton of these calls excited to talk to you wow i'm really glad that i got in touch with you today wow i've been really excited about being able to speak with you just setting that tone at the beginning to say, I'm excited about this. I want you to be excited as well and see if you can get that enthusiasm across. For timing on that enthusiasm, um, one of our audience members asked how early or late is too early or late to call a prospect? That's a, that's a great question. Uh, I made a post about this and it was a heavy debate and some people agreed with me, some people did, they did it. So um, we'll contextual we'll see how you guys feel. First of all, before I answer this question, everyone on this call is in different cultures, you're in different time zones and you may be in a different country, I don't know. So my answer is subjective based on where the culture of your calling. So my belief is I call someone, I like calling people before they get in the office. So that's around most people in nine to five, I like calling between that eight to nine space. I've called people at 7.50 before early in the morning and I've gotten answers and I've had good conversations. I've also called people after work, which is around five to six range. And I've gotten good conversations because people are commuting, so they don't have anything to do. So if I cold call them, it's a better conversation. Reason I do it before work, I know they haven't gone into a meeting, any meetings yet. So they're more open to our conversation. After work, they've gone through a lot of meetings. They don't have a lot of objections to throw at me because they're probably exhausted and tired. So they're at least willing to hear me out. And it's a direct yes or no if they're interested. So 
I like the early and I like after work, but I know Chad Steve may have different thoughts, but that's been my cadence as a rep as a whole. Yeah, just don't call on the weekends. There was some trend that happened right. recently where I got a ton of phone calls on Sunday afternoons. I was like, what's this about? So yeah, I, I'm with Morgan. I like the earlier, the late. If you catch me on my commute, you're gonna get a conversation whether it's coming to work or leaving, because that's something else to do. Very good. And in our business, because we measure dial to connect rates across uh, 20 reps on the phone, um, we're seeing, believe it or not, this is, this is odd to me, but 11 to noon is the highest dial to connect rate. That said, or sorry, I should say, lowest style to connect rate the fewest styles get the most connects that said if you're if you're dealing with more junior people of course they're more likely to answer the phone between 11 and noon but if you're dealing with more senior people everything that morgan and chad just said applies and you got to catch them in the beginning of the day so it's, again it's always going to depend it's going to depend the, on the persona if you're calling finance executives they're almost always staying late to close the books on something you can talk to cfos six seven eight o'clock at night a lot of more former investment bankers are used to being at work then. If you're calling an IT professional, you got to catch them in the beginning of the day before the fires happen or before stuff pops up. If you're calling CIOs. I would talk to CIOs at 630 in the morning routinely at the <laughs> yep. CIO level. And they'd say, I, I've already been here for two hours. So don't don't put your own predispositions and your biases on these things. Instead, you got to test different things and figure out what, what's working and then do more of it. All right. Intros count. Talk about weak sauce. What What is that? Okay, so I already talked about this, how you're doing today. Uh, you guys heard my New York example. Other reason, again, some people like this and it works for them. I'm not discounting this one, I'm just saying why it's weak and what my preface is. So the other reason I don't like is because, let's be honest, nobody cares how someone's day is really going when they ask someone how you're doing. The reason that people use that is to pattern interrupt your own self because you're not prepared for the call as much as the prospect isn't prepared for the call. So essentially as a sales rep, you're making calls, you're making calls, you finally get someone, you're like, your heart jumps up because you're like, wait, I finally got someone live after 40 calls. So innate nature is like, oh, how are you doing today? And obviously they're just gonna be like, good. And then you go into the intro of whatever that is, but you've already set the stage and you've set the tone for the prospect to already know it's a sales call because most sales reps say, how are you doing today? So that's one reason I don't like that one. So touching base and checking in, obviously that, that provides no value to the conversation. Is this a good time? It's, I don't think anyone ever has answered a cold call and be like, this is the greatest time of my life to answer a cold call. And then I'm sorry to bother you. You called them out of the blue. You're already bothering them. Don't bring that up. Just go into the reason for the call. You already bothered them, just go into it. Powerful intros, I talked about this one already. Thank you for taking my call. Do you have a few moments? The reason for my call is, and then the can you help me? Some of you guys may be getting gatekeepers. You may be getting executive assistance. So I use the can you help me when a gatekeeper answers the phone. I use it this morning and essentially they are a nicer tone. Now, this is every single time gonna get you by the gatekeeper is just gonna have a fruitful conversation every single time. No, but you will have more meaningful conversations, at least get more data out of the conversation than just trying to bulldoze over a gatekeeper. So those are the differences between the weak and the powerful. Yeah, I think 10, that, that 10 seconds is prime real estate. So why would you ask a question you already know the answer to or that you always get the same answer for? You want to ask something that's going to progress the conversation or at least engage their mind and get their wheels turning. I mean, even a simple shift from how are you today to how's the weather in the city that you're in is, is something different than they got asked the last 20 cold calls that they got. So it's anything that can differentiate you from the other 20 sales calls where they just got, how are you doing today? Let me give you a value prop and a pitch and let's get through this. Differentiate yourself, ask different questions, make a list of questions that people have different reactions to about different cities or sports teams or things that you can uncover when you're looking at their LinkedIn and then get them engaged early in the conversation. I mean, that's one of the biggest tricks to getting through the first 10 seconds is having them engaged instead of just putting them in listening mode and ready to hang up. Guys, I can't emphasize, so listen to this. This is important. The, 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 to summarize what's been said so far, in the, the testing that we have done has, has validated this. Number one, be different. Do something different than everybody else is doing. Morgan's referring to this as a pattern interrupt. Number two, be confident and own the different thing that you're doing. Number three, measure. If that thing is not working, if you're, your connect to conversation rate, right? There's a dial to connect rate and then there's a connect to conversation rate. If your connect to conversation rate's falling below about 70%, that's danger zone. That means we gotta switch it up because something's gotta be done differently so that when I get to the plate and I actually have an at bat, I can get more hits. Uh, two real quick uh, answers to questions. I'm looking over Sam's shoulder here. Um, 
I think it's Elsie or Elsie is in, uh, she said, I'm in the UK. I think you got, in terms of the UK, some of those cultural standards are going to be a little bit different. However, test it. I can't emphasize that one enough because there, there is some predisposition to people who are in the UK selling to people in the UK. And when we show up as Americans selling into the UK, we get away with stuff that you guys think you can't get away with. And we just blame it on being brash yanks over here. So try different things before you say, oh, it doesn't work. I can't call that early. It's, it's not culturally accepted. Nonsense. Do it 20 times and, and see for sure if that bias is in fact correct. The second question we got was from Hunter. Hunter asked about text. Um, Hunter, I have some awesome um, research on text that I can share your way. I posted it at one point. Sam, I don't know if you can find this in my old post, but you know what I'm talking about? You probably saw that one. If not, I'll, I'll dig it up and send it to you later on. Um, and then the final point, number five, is what Morgan's about to go into here. We all have, it's Mike Tyson, we've all got a plan until we get punched in the mouth. So we've got to have backup plans. You've got to have a plan B and a plan C. So what do you have to say about this, Morgan? Yeah, so there's there's two different things here. So if you have a rough intro, sometimes it's it's going to be, there is no recovery. Because the prospect could have a, be having a bad day, and your intro wasn't on point, and it's off. The same thing with discovery calls. Like, sometimes I have a discovery call, and it's not a good discovery call, and there's nothing you can do to recover it. So let's first and foremost, there's going to be times, before I give the advice here, there are going to be times where you do face a rough intro, and hey, just get up, take a walk, go outside, and then come back. The more that you stare at your computer and you're upset, it's not going to help you on the next call because if you don't have the right confidence and energy, then you're going to be off. Now, when you have a rough intro, let's say you're just, you feel the calls going off, always have a go-to question. So if you, your intro was off, you feel like this person is just not there, you can tell they're about to hang up on you, like set yourself up with a go-to question that makes the person think. So an example of a go-to question. So if I'm calling a sales leader, let's say my intro was bad, they're like, they're like, hey, I'm not interested in this at all. I have a go-to question place. So mine is, hey, look, so no, my intro was a little bit off here, but quick question for you. Are you 100% confident right now that all your sales reps can call into their top tier accounts and convert them based on the cold calls they're doing? You're like, no, Morgan, they're not. So boom, then now I have at least an entry point to a long gain of how we can help, talk about, hey, how I messed up on an intro. We help people make sure that they don't, and then I can set up certain documentation and, and facts and statistics around it. So that was just an example, and I have more questions that I have, but for, for time's sake, when you have or going through a rough intro, have a go-to question you have to elongate the conversation. Everyone tweet us, hashtag call camp. Sam is just furiously typing answers, monitoring Twitter. Come on, you know, show us some love. Throw the comments out there. Let's make it happen. <laughs> All right, here's, here's why we did this. We're listening to real calls. All right, everyone, let me just, I'm going to set everyone up to, to understand what's happening in these calls. The people that you're going to listen to on these calls, three out of the four faces that you're looking at right now are, 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 are pure play prospectors, mostly cold outbound, and they're averaging 15 to 20 completed appointments per rep per month, which in the modern world is pretty darn good number. That's a pretty darn good number. It looked a lot different 10 years ago. A lot of things looked different 10 years ago. We all did. Chad and I had less gray hair. All right, so I wanna make, make sure everybody understands that number one, these are very good professionals. They work for us. They work for us here at Exec Vision. You're listening to real calls here. Suspend your judgment for a minute. We're gonna talk about what are the things we can do to improve and have an attitude of Kaizen towards these calls. Batter up, Tyler, let's do it. Good morning, Jim. Hey, Jim, this is Tyler with Exec Vision. How are you doing this morning? Hold on a second, please. Yeah, you got it. Hello? Yeah, sorry, Jim. Can you hear me now? Yeah, what's up? Yeah, you got it. Uh, reason I was reaching out, Jim, my apologies for kind of catching up first thing here. I've been talking to a number of execs around sales, more specifically inside sales. I, you know, stumbled across your LinkedIn, saw your purview over national advertising sales. Obviously, that's a very, you know, broad, more strategic title. I was just wondering if you were working with your team in a you know, coaching capacity at all, or if you were strictly that bird's eye view. Uh, either you called me last week, or I'm just on everybody's coaching, email, marketing, phone lists, but I'm not interested. Thank you so much. All right. Oh, hey, I well, I you got it. I appreciate right. the candor. Okay, great Jim. You got right. it. Hey, thanks. I'm sure none of you have ever had that happen to you, which is why 907 of you signed up 
for this event. So, uh, okay, <laughs> this is, I'll, I'll just, you know, kind of set this up. This is the, the classic scenario of someone saying, hey, I'm getting cold called a lot, basically. And, and this kind of felt and sounded like another cold call and he got the cold shoulder. Morgan, Chad, what are you hearing? Yeah, I heard the same thing. That's that's the fatigue that some people get when they're getting a ton of these calls. And then also, I think the the pitch sometimes just turns people off. I mean, even if it's the exact thing they need to hear to understand what you do and to move forward, uh, I, I'm a big fan of leading with some type of question that gets them engaged in the conversation before you launch into the the entire value prop. Yeah, I'm, I'm with Chad and with Steve here. It essentially was, this guy already knew he was about to get the sales pitch. So about like, I think second 22, I think it's right there before Tyler goes into the value prop should have been where the question should have been inserted and then allowed for something different. Because once the pitch was going, he immediately was like, oh yeah, this is another same generic pitch that I had or the value prop that I'm getting right now. And now he's in that cold calling fatigue when what he was saying could have obviously helped him. So I think asking a question there, getting the think and be like, oh yeah, I am struggling with that. And then the value prop would have been super helpful. Yeah, the provocative question. You guys both agreed it's time to ask that question there. Um, I put in here, and, and I'm trying to do more coaching by asking these days, so I'm trying to live more by um, uh, Michael Bungay Stanier's, really, I think it's now a classic, the coaching habit. Um, and I'm asking the question, what pre-call research could you use here to capture his attention? Referencing his title and responsibility did not work. So Tyler was asking about national advertising sales and basically clarifying, does that mean inside sales? But this guy was having none of it. And you could hear based on just the way he sounded that yeah. that that particular card, like I almost describe this as being like playing hearts or spades or clubs or one of those types of games where you have a partner and you're playing a card into their hand. Tyler selected very much the wrong card for this type of individual. And that's why he got the objection, which you see listed here that he got. Anything else to add, guys? How, what would the question be? So let's talk about, you know, what, what kind of question would you ask or what kind of pre-call research would you leverage that could have been different, that could have created a different outcome? I mean, there's a lot of different directions you can go with this. You can go as broad as something for your tool. Like, when was the last time you listened to someone on your team making a call? Start, a, I mean, just seeing what you throw out, what you can get back from that question. Oh, I don't ever listen to calls. Well, then how do you give them feedback? Or how do you ensure that feedback's actionable? Just those types of questions get you into a conversation that's already going to lead you down the path to talk more about your tool. And it's going to let them tell you your value prop to you if they're answering the questions the way that you need them to. Yeah, I, I would. My question there would be, you know, what what is your like walk me through your current process to make sure that you're coaching your reps effectively and they're doing the stuff that you actually are coaching them on. Beautiful. So walk me through your process or when's the last time you listened to a call, something like that to try to engage them and again, get into the cortex part of the brain and get out of the brainstem. Guys, funny enough, while we're sitting here doing this webinar, I just got a cold call from a 402 number. I almost never get cold calls, by the way. So maybe someone out there is uh, is listening. That's pretty good stuff. <laughs> Uh, some other things that are just worth noting here um, that you notice this connect no conversation. That's the disposition for the call, which makes it significantly easier. We haven't talked about this on the call, but to the extent that people are using solutions like, you know, a dial source or an outreach or a sales loft or an inside sales.com, those types of solutions, a five, nine, there, there are many, many of them. Um, in this particular case, we're using dial source for this call uh, or connect and sell. Some of the other ones we're going to hear are connect and sell. Um, the dispositions are really important part of this because I was able to quickly pull, show me all the calls where we had a connect no conversation and it was these reps um, and they were ones where I had comments on. I can get right to just that, that one thing we're going to focus on as part of the process. So having the ability to very, very quickly and easily get to the coachable moments and the calls that matter is a big part of the story for how you're actually going to drive improvement, get the reps better. All right. So next, next up, Kanika. And, and I think, Steve, before we jump into Kanika's call, Joshua, who's always super engaged, thanks, dude, uh, <laughs> wanted to get us to touch on voice quality and tonality, uh, mentioning that some reps sound very nervous when they call and have a quiver to their voice, or they sound very flat and monotone with their version of a Hollywood voice. What do you guys recommend for over <laughs> yourself? 
Oh, I got I got two things because I had a rep who was super monotone and I would always give her a hard time about it. So I said, first of all, if you're monotone and you don't have an inflection of voice and it's just not something that you're good at, stand up when you make your calls. If you stand up, you're going to sound way better. You're going to sound way more energetic and you're going to be good. Now, to towards the energy of the call at the beginning, what you also need to do here is chameleon effect. So you don't need to be, I talked about enthusiasm, right? But you don't need to be jacked up out of your mind and the person being super serious. That person is actually going to be turned off. So in the first couple, five seconds of the call by the, how the person answers, that's how your voice should be. So if someone answers the phone like super happy, then you should be to sit happy. If they answer super serious, you still need to be serious and confident. And how you build that confidence is essentially what I always tell people is, I think the best example is Steph Curry. You guys have probably seen Steph Curry before. He's doing really well in the playoffs. The reason that he can do shots and the reason he makes so many shots is because his confidence in his shot is off the charts. How he got that is because he's always practicing his shots. He's doing fadeaways. He's doing half-court shots. He's doing full-court shots. He's fading away into the benches. He fades away into the audience. So essentially, he practices that. So the only way to truly be confident in your approach from the get-go of the call is do a mock cold call either with your manager or your colleague before you get on the call so that your confidence will skyrocket. If you're not practicing and you're not mock cold calling before you actually do your cold calls, you're going to not sound confident because you haven't gotten someone on the phone in a while. You haven't been practicing, so you're going to sound off. Yeah, and uh, I'm going to really tell my age here, but I, I go all the way back old school to put a mirror somewhere around you and look at it. That, that's what people are hearing. They're hearing whatever that face is you're making when you're about to make that call. And you remind yourself to smile. I had, I had an employee over to Sheba that used to do this, had kind of a grimacing uh, face, just resting at the desk, leaning forward over the computer, put a mirror up and started smiling all the time and just noticed a tremendous difference in people willing to engage with her on the phone. So that's a big one. And then like Morgan said, they're standing up, but body posture in general affects how you speak. If you're leaned over your computer, I mean, most of us have like the cell phone shoulder hunch nowadays anyway. So you have to really think about extending your body, like sitting back, keeping your frame open, because the more you lean forward and collapse your breath, uh, the, the more tired or the more down or the, or the lower the energy sounds. So even if you're not going to get up and run around the room, I know lots of people put tons of miles on the pedometer on the sales floor every day, but you can achieve a lot of the same things just by elongating your body by just sitting up uh, straight in your chair. And guys, uh, Chad Dyer is an opera singer. He was a professional opera singer. He, I, I guess when you're when you're once a professional, you're always a professional. So there is science in this. This is not again some opinion. If you want to see more about this, you should uh, look at a YouTube or not YouTube, excuse me, a, a TED Talk. So TED Talks from a woman named Amy Cuddy, C U D D David David Y Amy Cuddy, and maybe Aunt Sam can throw the link in there for us. But Amy Cuddy, she has a wonderful thing on body posture and how it affects your confidence level. And literally, the, the stress hormone in your, in your, your brain releases called cortisol goes down based on power posing and things like that. Fascinating talk. Um, and the thing that's even more interesting about it is that blind people even have the same effect. So the people who have been blind their whole life and never saw another person have the same thing going on where when they win a race, they throw their hands up in the air into a V and make themselves bigger, and that causes the cortisol to go down in their brain. So check that out, Amy Cuddy. All right, let's go with Kanika's call. This is Hector. Hi, Hector. This is Kanika at Exec Vision. How are you? I'm sorry, this is who? Kanika at Exec Vision. I know I'm catching you out of here, Hector. Do you have a quick second? Uh, no, um, Exec Vision. What is this about? We're actually a call coaching platform. Actually, you and I connected a couple months I, ago. When I can't. Right now, I'm very busy. Can you call back, please? Yeah, when's a good time for me to meet back out? Um, Friday at 4 o'clock. Okay, I can call you back then. Thank you, man. Bye. Morgan, start with your comment right here. Yeah, so essentially, as I was telling you, I got the hire doing today. So I got this a lot when I was doing this as a rep is people would be confused. They wouldn't know what my who my name was and they didn't know what my company was. And so what I always tell people is no one at the beginning of the cold call cares about your name or your company unless I'm saying like, hey, I'm The Rock, right? Then people are gonna be like, all right, you're The Rock, I'm listening, or like Bill Gates. But essentially, if you don't have that insight or reason and you're coming with a name that they're not familiar with and maybe a company that they haven't heard before, they're gonna go into a confused state. So you saw like at about second five to about second eight there, or second seven, he was confused. And now you have to go uphill battle. So now you gotta explain who you are and what you do. Then he's like, okay, give me, now tell me the reason for your call. 
And then now you have two interrupts. Now you finally get to the reason, but now they are already getting more, not frustrated, but definitely flustered that you haven't gotten to the point yet. So that's kind of the reason why I was stating that in my comment there is because the person's already confused and now you're fighting uphill battle when you're already calling them cold. Chad, anything to add? Yeah, I, I totally agree. I feel like when you get somebody on the phone, you just got to launch in. If you, if you take that second to be like, hey, I'm going to say the same thing that everybody else has already said to you when you've gotten the other 10 cold calls today, it doesn't really set you apart. So I think leading with the purpose of the call always feels really straightforward. And it's like, okay, you're respecting my time. You don't have to ask me for, for, for permission. You don't have to go through the hemming and hawing. It's just like, hey, glad I got you. The purpose of this call is, I mean, maybe a little more finesse than that. But that's the flow that I like when someone's giving me a call trying to sell me something in the middle of a busy work day. And again, you're hearing the pattern. The brainstem is the thing that's reacting. The, the, this guy, Hector, a director of telesales that looks like Spark Energy, he, he, he never is rationally engaging in any of this because there wasn't anything worthy of rationally engaging for. So as a result, that's why you're hearing the the, the, the lizard brain is reacting to this. I, I, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm very busy. I'm right in the middle of something. Okay, thank you. No, thank you. Friday at four, thank you, right? And then it also begs the question, do you send a calendar invite for that time? I mean, if you do, do you book the meeting for yourself or do you book it for a counterpart that you're gonna be handing it off to if you are handing off to a counterpart? So interesting questions that we contemplate as we go through the calls. Let's go to Rich. All right, let's hear Rich's call. And again, one of the things you're hearing is you're gonna hear a lot of similarities because these people sit next to each other. And in fact, one of the things we're working on in our own organization right now is decreasing the number of connects, no conversations, partially because we started using so much connect and sell um, that we're having just at bat after at bat after at bat after at bat. We have to be very cognizant of our batting average. Actually, Sam, can you share the, there you go. You know where I'm going, Charity smiled. Um, we're going to send this, share, if you look in the chat here, an article I wrote on the one sales acceleration metric you need to be measuring, batting average. Number of conversations, how many of those convert to appointments? Um, for our top reps, Jackie, Alex, Tesfa, Michael, we know that they can convert one out of every two or two and a half conversations to appointments, which is off the charts because they do this stuff so well. But if you're not measuring it, you're not going to know. You're not going to know. And I know Rich right now is hovering more around one out of every six of his conversations into appointments. So if we can get that number down to one out of every two or one out of every three, bam, instant pipeline. And then, you know, of course, that's going to turn into more business. Hello. Hi, Mike. This is Rich with Exact Vision. How are you? Good. Good to hear. And I know I'm catching you out of the blue here. Do you have a quick second to chat? Yeah, what's this regarding? So it was in regard, it was regarding um, your role here heading up commercial and family lines of business. And based on what I saw on your LinkedIn, I would imagine that you're heading up the customer facing team, you know, reps living and dying by the phone every day. No, that's not me. I'm sorry. Thank you. Good old fashioned hang up. Like we used to get, right, Chad? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Chad, how about you go first? <laughs> yeah, th this guy had a pretty specific tone and, and to tell him what he does instead of asking him what he does is where he lost them. You know, giving that big pitch of this is the thing and this is what I read on LinkedIn and I would assume that you do this. Uh, he could have saved that, compressed it and asked him a question, one question saying, hey, are you responsible for this? I, I saw your LinkedIn, it looks like you're the right guy, are you? And then ask for the redirect if he's not responsible for it so you can at least have a, a some kind of outcome that's going to lead you forward in the in the sales process which sometimes is i'm not the right person to talk to about this morgan yeah so this goes back into chad's point and then goes back to the persona slide so essentially if you're talking to someone above the power line they they know what their role is they know what company they're at so being to telling them hey this is what i see on your linkedin is like the obvious for them so here, obviously, there's two approaches. One, asking a question, or two, I didn't write in there, going directly into what you already know what their priorities are and how you help that job title. So for example, if Rich here is like, hey, look, I know Michael, VP of commercial sales. These are the three things that people care about when they talk to us. One, two, three. Are any of those currently in your world right now, or am I completely off? And then he's like, well, hey, Rich, like one of those actually is like really one of our main things that we really need to focus on here. And then boom, then you can have a conversation with them. And the reason that that's effective is because you're directly stating 
hey, I know about you as, as a persona and I know what you're doing day to day. Not like, oh, I see your VP of sales and we call VP of sales, so we need to set a meeting. It's you actually know those priorities. Or question, going back to what we talked about in the beginning there, some type of impact question to get him to open up more, to think, because he was at least open to it. And as Chad's point, his tone was like, hey, get to the point and give me some value. Because he was willing to listen. It just, the value prop was off base for what he was looking for. Morgan's uh, a concept, everyone, this is worth noting. It's worth actually writing down. We refer to it as crawl, walk, run. Morgan, you sort of position it as like the multiple choice. And the reason it's so effective, um, we've done, actually done a lot of experimenting with that. The reason it's so effective is because it gives the person context. The multiple choice itself is context for what's going on. So if you say, hey, um, M Michael, when we speak to your peers, they're either A, not doing any recording of calls whatsoever, basically winging it as it comes to sales performance, B, they're just starting to leverage recordings for training and coaching, and C, they're really impacting change, and they're they're up-leveling their, their B performers by 20%, making them more like their A players. Where are you, A, B, or C? And now they have the context, and now they, it's, it's a great way to engage that part of the brain and hopefully get into the rational cortex. Uh, one of the other things I'm doing here is I, I hovered over the topics, the keywords organized by topics. Because one of the things we're seeing in this call is no questions, no go for time, nothing on messaging, and really the elements of lead-in that we listen for are not present in this call. So it's a great way to be able to actually measure quantitatively and know whether or not they're executing this the way it was intended to be. All right, last one, and then we're gonna do a, a special a special extra credit today where everyone's gonna get to hear when I got hung up on. <laughs> I'm sure you'll relish that. And then later on, I call him back though. All right, here's Alex Dixon. Lisa. Good morning, Lisa. This is Alex Dixon with ExecVision. Got a moment? Uh, no, actually, I don't, unfortunately. I have two minutes before my next meeting. But if you wanted to send me uh, a meeting request, that'd be great. Sure, absolutely. What's your email? Lisa.stanton at Cox.com. I'll shoot that over right now. Okay, thank you. Yep. She's one of your uh, southern uh, personas there, Morgan. <laughs> she is so <they're> nice. <laughs> a New York person like, get out of here. <laughs> Shut you down. I know how it is, uh, but okay. So my thing here is, she had she said she had two minutes, but at the same time she said she didn't have time. It's contradictory. She had time, at least 30 to 60 seconds, as I talked about earlier. So I would have been like, hey, look, give me just 30 seconds to explain, because she said it's in a meeting request, which, as we all know, happy years. Oh yeah, you're gonna, okay, I'm setting up a meeting, but we all know that person's probably not going to show up. Now, if you would have said, what I would have done here is. 30 seconds, I just want to real quick explain what we do, so you at least have context of what this meeting's about, and she would have shut that down. Still would have sent her a proposed time, but would have sent an agenda beforehand to get, at least let her know what's about to happen. But the fact that she said, I have two minutes before I go into the meeting, gives me at least 30 to 60 seconds to explain what I'm about, to then have a, a more meaningful conversation and meeting, because right now she doesn't even know what you do. Um, she didn't mention she knew exec vision, so she has no idea what I'm calling about or what our solution even can provide for her. Love it, Chad. Yeah, she definitely gave you a window to have a conversation right there. But I, I listen to this call and I'm like, does she even know who you are? Does she know what she's setting a meeting about? Um, right. or did, you could ask one qualifying question. Are you in any way responsible for coaching? Or can you direct me to who is, or can we make sure that we have all the right people set up on this meeting so that we can have a productive conversation? So I think one question would have made all the difference in this case, just to make sure you're talking to the right person or someone that cares about it. So this meeting that's going to take up someone's valuable time is set with someone who has expectations when they come into it instead of just another blind meeting. Now, this is great because this <clears throat> call, I had Alex Dixon say, hey, are you going to play this earlier this morning? Are you going to play this on call camp? I said, yeah, we're going to play it on call camp. Is that okay? He said, yeah, yeah. He goes, tell them that later on I was able to book the appointment over email properly with context. So he basically used this, and this is where we all got to remember, right? I, I can't remember the last person who called me out of the blue. Can any of you? I mean... Who was the last person who cold called you or even called you based on filling out a web form? And a lot of people say, oh, I remember it was blank, LexisNexis. Okay, that's good, great. All right, what was the name of the person? Nobody ever remembers. So it just goes to show a lot of what we're talking about here is like, like it, every single one of these calls that we heard, none of these prospects are going to remember these calls. 
None of them. It's not like it was a scheduled discovery call where they're going to, you're going to create some impression. And as a result, you basically have unlimited mulligans, sort of like my golf game. I just tee another one up and whack it into the woods. And sooner or later, something goes down the fairway. So if you have an unlimited amount of mulligans, keep going. And this is what Alex Dixon here did. He basically just, just got his name associated with her. Although I, by the way, guys, I agree with your points. He had a window. He had a window. If he was better trained and more equipped, he's one of our newer reps. He totally would have taken that. But because right. he did that, he was able to get the thing later on over email. So there's no substitution for the persistence factor and for the fact that you can do a redo. Go back over and do it again and lead with purpose, lead with questions, lead with the right kinds of things. Guys, anything to add there? No, that's a great point. I'm glad that he followed up on it was being persistent. So that, that's a great thing that he did. I don't have anything to add beyond that. That's yeah, he went back and said it. He, he put the context in there and he got the appointment. So that's what this call was missing. Bingo. Here's a classic hang up from my friend Craig Chapman. Here we go. How's it, Craig? Hi, Craig. It's uh, Steve Richard from .com. How are you? Hi, right, thanks. Good. Can you hear me okay? You're very faint. I can. Okay, great. Do you have a quick second? Uh, for .com? No, I don't. What the hell? Oh, wait, what's, what, why, why do you feel that way? Love about that call is you actually hear the phone <laughs> hanging up like, wait a minute. <laughs> the actual thing. <laughs> <laughs> and that, by the way, that was completely real and that's not staged. These guys have not heard the call. Okay, critique me. What would you have done different? And then you're going to hear what I do next. Well, I have an unfair advantage because I know the uh, ending of this story. <laughs> Morgan. <laughs> okay, cool. So I, I, I think essentially he sounded like a straight shooter. So instead of asking, do you have a few moments? I would have gone right into it and say, hey, look, the reason, it sounds like, sounds like you're too busy. The reason for my call is, and I would have gone straight into it. Just based on his first tone alone, because he was just like, yeah, I'm fine, which most likely means that you need to go straight into it because they know it's a sales call, but they also know if this is not right, I'm, I'm going to blow you off and hang up. So that's, that's what I would have done there. I, I, I think that's right. I think there was no, I should not have played the permission to continue card there that was misplayed. Um, and then, and then the other thing is it's quite apparent that in this particular case, this guy hung up because of something that this company had done uh, to him previously, which is exactly why I called back. And you're going to hear what I have to say. How's it? Craig, it's, it's Steve. I, I, I apologize. I know you hung up on me. I'm not stupid, but I, I, I feel like we did something to deserve that. I don't know what it is. I did some uh, research on I, you. I, 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 I dealt with .com before. And, uh, what, what happened? Uh, charging one month for, for the advertising fee for rent was just a ridiculous price compared to others. Most media. Got it. So, so you, so, so basically, it was a bad return on investment for you. Correct. Okay. So, so how long ago was that? Well, it's been a couple of years. A few years back ago? When, back when you guys were first starting out. Okay, when we were first starting out. I don't know if you knew this. There have been a whole bunch of changes. Frankly, sometimes I get that from from property owners like you and, and landlords like you. Um, there have been a whole bunch of changes in our organization. I know you've got literally hundreds of homes there in, in Big Rapids. I watched your video. And... Um, I was wondering if you might reconsider just having a quick chat, quick chat with us on what's changed since then. And, you know, if there's no opportunity to win back your business, I respect that. If there I'm is, quite, 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 Steve, you're, 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 you're enough to call back and plan enough to do so. So I'm, I'm willing to hear you. Go ahead. All right. There you go. And I ended up in the meeting. Now, I did have a question here, and she said, "How long before you called back, Karen?" The answer to that question is right away. Um, and whereas the <laughs> notion is to say is to call back and say. Um, hi, I think we got disconnected. By the way, I've, I've used that line many, many times. It generally doesn't work. Um, in this case, I knew it wasn't going to work, so I played a different card. I threw out the ace of spades, and I threw some pre-call research at him and told him about the fact that I watched his videos, and that, that worked. I got him to pay attention. Morgan, break it down. Yeah, no, I, I love this. And, I, and Steve, I actually use the ice is the same thing. Oh, we got disconnected. <laughs> and they're like, no, I hung up on you. I'm like, dang it. <laughs> but... But I like the reason I like this is because Steve led with empathy. I think you all can see that. And by him leading with empathy, empathy and being like, okay, so I felt like something was off here. What happened? And then explaining a case of what went wrong was great. And there were probably a lot of people on this call 
where you're maybe at a legacy company or a company that's been around for a while. And four years ago, someone's like, oh, well, I, we had a terrible experience. And it's just like, hey, well, a lot's changed since then. We've had a couple product updates, just calling you to see, you know, what we can do from a change perspective, what happened, leading with that empathy and then letting them to be like, oh, okay, like you're not just a regular sales rep. You really care about like what's going on with me. I'm open to hearing you out. And then that leads into more of a conversation instead of a sales call. Yeah, and music, we call this the place and embrace where you hit the note really hard and then you warm it up with your voice. And Steve did that. Hey, I know I, I know you hung up on me. I'm not stupid. Match the tone and then circled back around to empathy and brought him back down the road with him. So I love that. It was a classic place and embrace to me. Ooh, place and embrace. I'm personally a fan of anything that, that comes from a different field of study, which is uh, part of the reason why I do love Keenan's coaching, observe, describe, prescribe. So place and embrace from singing and how we can apply that to sales is good stuff. I think we have unbelievable amounts of questions which means we probably did our jobs pretty well, Chad and Morgan. Good job, guys. Um, Sam, what do we got? What's coming in? We've got so many great questions. Uh, I do want to hear somebody asked about what's our opinion on voicemails and their effectiveness. Yeah. I'm a voicemail fan. I want to know who's calling me. Somebody from Philadelphia has called me like 20 times in the past week and never left a voicemail. <laughs> now I, just have a, I already have a personal vendetta against them if they ever reach me now. So leave a voicemail. Let me know who you are. If I like what you do and you convince me, I'm going to talk to you. I think tools are super cool and I want to hear all about them. So call me, but leave me a voice message and tell me why I should talk to you. Hey, shout out to Philly. <laughs> ghost, ghost calling Chad. <laughs> Yeah, I was gonna go to Philadelphia and hunt this person down. I'm like, all right, who is it? <laughs> I've already done some research. Just, I've got five suspects. <laughs> I love it. So, voicemails. I'll be honest with you guys. When I first started making calls, I absolutely hated doing them for the reason that Chad wants it. Because I didn't want anyone to know who I was, so I would always just continuously call without a voicemail. Because when I leave a voicemail, I, my assumption was, oh, they're just gonna block me now because they know who I am. So I've changed since then, and. What I do now with voicemails is I make sure that I tell the prospect not to call me back. So what I do is I'll lead with, hey, Chad, the reason for my call is we help sales and able leaders like yourself uh, help increase KPIs, whatever my pitch is. And I say, if that's impactful for you, no need to call me back. I'm about to send you a voice message on LinkedIn or I'm about to send you an email. And then by doing that, it, it alleviates the pressure of a person to call me back because, first of all, they're not, they most likely won't some industries they might but most industries they won't call you back so by alleviating that pressure and saying go reply to my email go to reply to this voice message it directs them to go check that out and then now i can have more context on that message i send them so that's more so how i leave voicemails i can i can echo that because morgan cole called me at some point and left me a beautiful <laughs> message and then we had coffee and that's how we're friends today so he left me a message that was the beginning of our beautiful friendship so yep. all in on the voice message <laughs> Yeah, amazing. Bob Perkins, the chairman of the AISP, the reason that, that I know him and he's like a big brother to me really is is uh, because of a cold call that one of my reps at the time made. And when he called Bob, he led with, hey, I see that you're starting this association. So don't discount that the power of that pre-call research, guys. If you know something about that company and that individual, it's very, very powerful way to create relationships, which is why we're cold calling in the first place. Tell us about this dialing workshop. If you guys are in the Chicago area or in Illinois, uh, it's going to be focused on messaging and cold calling and how to be confident with your framework. So a lot of stuff that I touched on today will actually be in a full day of workshop with exercises. So if you're in the Chicago area and you want to come, come on down and hear me speak the gospel on cold calling. It, is that, hold on, Morgan, is that free? Is that paid? I mean, what, what, what's, what's... Uh, yeah, so Eventbrite, yeah, if there's an Eventbrite link that should be somewhere. Um, it is a paid event. Uh, prices are on there. So if okay. you have any but questions, let me know. That's, a, that's a, probably an unbelievable value to be able to, so you're going to be having everybody in a workshop. People are going to be making real calls. People are going to be working their real prospects, and you're going to be working with them the whole time to make sure that they're effective. Yep, and then, yeah, we'll go through, actually, like, my best practices, what I actually say on the phone, my own cold call, call formulas, like all real live application. Awesome. Guys, real is greater than fake. I think we've seen that. You know, salespeople, generally speaking, as much as we know practice is important, um, you know, we, we don't do as much of it as we need to because anytime we're dealing with real scenarios like he's dealing with with everybody, it's going to be so much more impactful. So check that out, the dialing workshop in Chicago, June 5th. And Chad's authored some sales books. Tell us about your latest one. 
I have a book coming out this summer called Bring Your Best Self to Work that talks about uh, how you can use your personal authenticity to connect with other people and close more business. Simple enough. So everyone check out Chad's books, Bringing Your Best Self to Work. And then you got, is How to Talk to Humans is the next one up? Is that it? The How to Talk to Humans was out in 2015 and it's about how to uh, establish boundaries when building communication strategies with the people that you work with. Shame on me. I need to read that book. I should have known that. That's my fault. I did not do my pre-call research, so we figured that out. And then our friends at Sales Intel has, has got an offer for us around his ABM right for you, so you can check that out as well. Finally, a lot of resources, everyone, in, in the resource center. Um, anything from how to handle call recording laws, uh, how to create an amazing sales coaching culture, um, how to diagnose how you're using your call recordings in the first place. Please do check that out. What's our next call, Camp Sam? Next month, we're talking with Alice Hyman. I'm super stoked to have her on about trade show troubles, why your event leads aren't closing. So stay tuned for mm. you can do better follow up on your events. Following up on trade show leads. Nothing more fun on the planet. Good. All right. Hey, everyone, have a great day and uh, apply this stuff. You know, don't just let this be something you sit around and watch like it's TV and then you do nothing with it. Go and use it. Try a pattern interrupt. Do something different. Ask a provocative question. Do research on the company. Mix up your approach and, and test and see what works.